show you where you are in his view. It's, I mean, it's not a painful thing. Well, sometimes it's painful. Sometimes. But ask the Holy Spirit to do an audit. And you know, some of you have, have been way too complacent, been way too nice in the realm of the Spirit. And you've accepted stuff. You've accepted comments. You've accepted circumstances. You've accepted situations. That was not God's plan for you to have in your life. Now, He will bring the redemption. He will bring the turnaround, but it was never God's plan. And it's because we sit back and we accept and we tolerate the first little foothold of the enemy. Not thinking, oh, well, it's just the way life is. Oh, well, you know, God, God, God is teaching me something. The way that God generally teaches us is through the Word. So, and some of you need to rise up in a righteous anger. And say, you know what? This is not kingdom living. This is not kingdom provision. This is not kingdom health. Whatever it might be, but you need to rise up in a righteous anger and assert your authority through Jesus Christ. He is the King. So I'm looking for certain songs that um, reflect kingdom. Because we, we get the presence of God here and it's absolutely wonderful and I love to suck and worship as much as the rest of you. But there are times when you need some flipping good war songs. When you sing it and you, you know that it builds that victory on the inside and you walk out in victory, that's what we need to be singing. Because this is a time of warfare for the nation. So you start singing worshipy songs, soaking songs. We can do that occasionally, but you do that every week. You walk out of here with a passive attitude, thinking all you're going to have to do is soak in the presence of God and everything's going to turn out. That's not the way it works. Now you can worship and you can soak, but there are times when you need to have that victory chant. There are times when you need to understand the drum of the beat, the beat of the drum, the, the, way, the beat of the drum. And you need to know that there is a time of war. And in a time of war, you can come into the presence of God and you can soak, but it's not in a time of war. You do that on R&R. &R. You do that when you're not at base camp. You do that when you're not standing your ground. You do that and do that when you're not on the watchtower. But right now, for this nation, we need to be on the watchtower. We need to be walking in the fullness of the power of Christ right now for this nation. Amen. We need to be aware of victory. So worship and soaking, awesome. I'm not telling you not to do it. But I am saying that there is the other side of the coin, which is victory. And a church is what it seems. So for the ones like... Us, <laughs> been around a little bit longer than ones like you. <laughs> we um, we used to sing scripture and song, and it was just the word to music. But what it did was it built faith. It caused us to meditate the word. It gave us something on the inside that sometimes some songs don't give us. So we need to come back to victory because we serve a King who is majestic in power, authority, and. So, not sure if you still love me or not, but anyway, there we go. The reason that we're starting today is because we need to come back to an apostolic foundation. We cannot be an apostolic centre and training school without an apostolic foundation. And you know, they've got that book down the back, um, Apostolic Church Arising, I think I knew it was something like that. Apostolic Church arising down the back, which is awesome, get into that. But the other side of it is that there needs to be some destroying of um, mindsets, cultures, traditions, words, even vocabulary that have come from a pastoral church set. So we're going to be looking at what, what actually is going to happen. Because we're, we're moving from one wineskin, church culture, to a new wineskin, which means there's a new wine. So what's happened in the past is that there has been revivals, there's been things that happened, there's been a new wine that's been poured out, but there's been no new wine skin to hold the structure, there's been no new wine to hold the, the outpouring, and so the revivals, the awakenings, the things that God has started to move have been shut down. 
Revivals are meant to continue until a nation is reformed. So when Billy Graham came out in the 1950s to this nation, and he did all those massive rallies and so many thousands and thousands of people got born again. And, and well, I'm not sure about spirit filled, but they got born again. It affected the statistics of this nation. And it showed the very next year in the government statistics that alcoholic consumption was down. Um, pre what do you call them? Bad babies born out of wedlock, down. Um, divorce down, crime down. All the statistics were affected by what this man of God did when he came to this nation. But the year, two or three years later, our statistics were getting worse and worse and worse again because we did not know how to stupid and handle the, the movement that God started through Billy Graham. And so God was pouring out a new wine through Billy Graham, getting people saved, getting a revival happening, moving and awakening in this nation, but the church didn't change its structure, the church didn't change how it handled stuff, and so the new wine's being poured out into an old wine skin, and we lost hope. The church became powerless, and we lost a nation. We could have taken back in the 1950s. So we've got to change. I'm all for radical change. Because it's a bit like, you know, when you put a band-aid on a sore? As a kid, my mum always asked me, do you want to take it off slow, dear? Or do you just want to rip it off? And I'd say, rip it, just rip it. Because slow is longer. Just rip it. So we need to change. Because we've got a nation at stake. But more than anything else, you are going to stand before Christ and give an account of the assignment and the destiny that he's placed on your life, whether or not you fulfilled it. And you can't stand before him and say, oh, well, I fulfilled the church's vision, because God's going to say, that wasn't your vision. He said, I put a vision in your heart. I've called you to, I've called you to business. I've called you to education. I've called you to government. I've called you to reconciliation. I've called you to a specific thing. And if you have not fulfilled that, then there's going to be a few tears. So we need to change. We need to break some things down. So the apostolic is very different to the pastoral. And for the first eight years of the early church, it was nothing but apostolic. Government. Because that's what apostolic is, government. It's a military empowerment to bring about a new kingdom in a setting. So when the, the prophets arose, they were apostolic prophets. When the pastors arose, they were apostolic pastors. So in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 28, it gives a list of the gifts of the church. Let me just find 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Verse 28. And God has appointed these in the church first. And that word first actually means first in time, first in place. So it means first. First apostles, second prophets, third teachers. After that, miracles, then gifts of healing, helps, administrations, varieties of tongues. Where are the pastors? Not mentioned. And what is the church, what is the Western church all about? Pastors. But they're not mentioned in the list. The only time pastors are mentioned are in Ephesians chapter 4, verses 11, 12, and 13. Part of the fivefold. But they're not mentioned there. We're going to start to reassess some things. And if this is uncomfortable, I'm not going to apologize because I want to see change. I want to see change. So we have a whole heap of, of things. So we're going apostolic. Apostolic is ecclesia. Ecclesia is government. It is when Jesus told the disciples that I am building my church. I'm building my ecclesia, or ecclesia, however you want to pronounce it. When I'm building that, he says, it was a political, governmental term. It was not a religious term. It was purely governmental. God, Jesus was saying, I am building my government upon the earth. I am releasing the government of God upon this earth. That's what an ecclesia is. They are called out people who are, the, the, in, if the Romans in Israel, if two or three Romans got together and decided that they wanted to change a law, that was called an ecclesia, an ecclesia. And just by being two or three Romans in Israel, they could make a law. This is what we now decree is going to be. And that's what Jesus was telling us. 
It's not about church. You are the church. But the church is to release the government of God upon the earth. Do you feel ripped off? You should. You've been called to release God's government upon the earth. So, apostles are mentioned oh, about 87, 90 times. Prophets are about 150 something, teachers 120 or 130. Evangelists are mentioned three, pastors are mentioned once. In the New Testament. So how has it been that the whole church has come around pastors when they're mentioned once? I mean, there are shepherds mentioned in there, but usually they were watching sheep at night. A couple of times as bishops or overseers, but the, the word pastor, once. Do a strong search. So we're going to look at some things and say, what, what has happened? When Constantine flipped the church around, and then the Roman church with its selling of indulgences and everything, we became more and more shaped into something that God never designed. So now it's the age of the apostles. Now the cornerstone is always Jesus Christ. Always. Then you've got the apostles and the prophets. But that's to release government. Did, did Jesus say that I give you the keys? And whatever you, whatever, that word actually means whatever. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Whatever you bind will be bound. You have got incredible authority on the earth. Now under the Lordship of Jesus, we stay under his authority. You don't step out and do a maverick thing. You don't step out and do a lone ranger thing. You don't step out like Matthew 7 where they said, but Lord, Lord, we've done this and we've, we've healed and we've prophesied and we've done all these things in your name. And he says, but I never knew you. We never had a relationship. So everything we do is an ecclesia. It comes out of the relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. But you're supposed to be his government. So the pastoral church is all about meeting the needs of the people. Let me pray with you. Let me talk with you. Yes, I'll take your phone call. Um, yes, I'll marry you, baptize you, you know, bury you. I'll do, yeah, yeah, I'm just here to meet your needs. That's what a pastor is there for, just to meet the needs of the people. Guess what? That's not their job. That's not their job. To the pastor, everyone in the church is a congregant, it's a member, layman. To the apostle, everyone is the church, is the full-time minister of the gospel. And you are there to expand the kingdom of God. Even if you just got saved 30 seconds ago, you have the full right to use the name of Jesus and the power that's in that name to bring about a miracle. There is no difference between someone of Jesse's age and someone of my age in the realm of the spirit. There are different types of, of believers. There's baby believers, there's carnal Christians and things like that. And I'm talking to a group of people here, but I believe are sold out for the things of God. I believe that you want to see a nation change. I believe that you want to see the expansion of God's kingdom upon the earth. And so there seems some things that we need to shift and to change. One, you are all full-time ministers. You do not need to run to the pastor to get prayer. I'm not, I'm, if you want prayer, we're here. I don't, I'm not saying shut the door. But I am saying that you are, have as much right to the authority that is in the name of Jesus Christ as the pastor in the church office. Let everything be done decently and in order. But I'd rather have a bit of wildfire than no fire. So the pastors have said, come in, sit down, listen, get up and leave. I'm saying, come in, get equipped, get out and do. So we've got to bring everything back to an apostolic.
historic foundation. So that means we're going to have to change some mindsets. Now in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 9, my glasses, praise God. Isaiah 42, verse 9. God says, Behold, the former things have come to pass, and new things I declare, and before they spring forth, I tell you of them. So God's saying, the old stuff's finished. New stuff's coming, but you know what? I'm going to tell you about it. And isn't that what the Holy Spirit's for? Doesn't he show us things to come? Isn't the Holy Spirit there? Don't you have the spirit of prophecy on the inside of you? You don't need the prophecy. I mean, we do need the prophetic word. Forgive me, Sharon. We need the prophetic word. But you also have the spirit of Jesus, which is the spirit of prophecy, so that you can hear from God for yourselves. You don't need to hear fire somebody else. You can hear from God for yourselves. And he says, I'm telling you what is going to come to pass. And so you can sit down when you plan your business, when you plan your family stuff, when you plan things out. You say, Holy Spirit, you're the one who knows what's going to come. Will you show me what's coming to the future so that I can plan appropriately, that we can be wisely and well positioned? Quite often the Holy Spirit will tell me to start praying for things about a year or six months before I need them. So when the need arises, I've already got the money. Or already, I'm already positioned to walk into the opportunity. So you know, start listening to things like this. And so he says, I'm going to tell you about it. But then, you know, we've got to remember that this whole thing, not this whole thing, but this thing this afternoon, is about old wine skins and new wine skins. That you can't pour new wine into old wine skins. And so to make a wine skin was a tedious process. It was lengthy, it was long, it was consuming. So first of all, you've got to have the dead animal. Then you've got to skin it. You've got to take out all the muscles and the bones, the skeleton, all the organs. So that means that the structure's got to be completely cleaned out. And all that's left is the skin. So in order to move into the new move of God, guess what's got to be cleaned out of us? So that we become the new white skin to hold the new wine. Structures, mindsets, yeah. church, pastoral kind of thinking stuff, traditions. Because I want to hold the new wine, but I've got to be a new white skin. So they would take the wine and they'd seal the extremities and yeah, the neck was the spout and they'd have a lid for it and all of that. They'd soak it in water. And they would soak it in water until it became pliable and soft and flexible. That means that we have got to be washed by the washing of the water of the word until we are pliable, flexible, teachable, soft to the promptings of the Holy Spirit. Is this making sense? So that's a process. I wish God would just go zap. <sighs> but he doesn't, because he's more concerned about my character than he is about my comfort. But that's the way it works. You know, we've got, we've got to soak in the word. But let me tell you what soaking in the word is not. It is not listening to podcasts only. It is not only watching Christian TV programs. Soaking in the Word is opening the Word for yourself and spending time meditating. Meditate the Word until it becomes the Word made flesh in you. When it becomes the Word made flesh in you, no one can talk you out of it. No one can talk you out of it. You walk in the authority of the anointing of that word. And nothing can change that. And that releases the power of God. So if you want to head over to um, Mark chapter 2 verse 22. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. No one. It is just not the done thing. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Or else the new wine bursts the wineskins, the wine is spilled, and the wineskins are ruined. New wine must be put into new wineskins. 
New wine must be put into new wine skins. We have to change. If I have still part of a church culture in me, it's not going to hold the new wine. If I still have a pastoral kind of a concept about something, it's not going to hold the new wine. We've got to be kingdom, immersed in the Word of God, saturated by the washing of the water of the Word, yielded to the Holy Spirit, soft and pliable to what He wants to do and how He wants you to move and where He wants you to go. It's a new walk and it's a new way because we've got to make sure that there's nothing the old. Old wineskins are religion, tradition, old mindsets, old perspectives, old visions, outdated patterns of thinking, and it cannot contain the new wine. Matthew 9, 17. I want the new wine. I am longing for the new wine. Matthew 9, 17. They do not put new wine into old wine skins or else wine skins break. First, wine is spilled and the wine skins are ruined. They put new wine into new wine skins and both are preserved. So if I have any of the old structure in my way of thinking, traditional, religious, uh, outdated concepts, if I'm living out of even old revelation, old manner, and God wants to pour in the new wine, the part of the old is going to burst. It's not going to be able to handle the wine. So not only will the wine be spilled, but that part of my structure, that part of who I am, is going to be destroyed as well. Because it is not built to carry new wine. So let, let me tell you what old wine is. Old wine can also be old revelation. Now we've all carried revelation and we've got the revelation, we know it. But if you go back to the old revelation in a new season, that can be very dangerous. That can be new wine, old wine skin, and cause damage. There are enemies to the apostolic wine skin. There's not so many enemies to the, to the church culture because it's already entrenched in religion, tradition. So there's not too many enemies to that really because there's not a powerful move of God. They're not transforming their communities. You know, they're in, the, in Acts, they were said, hey, listen, the people have come here who turned their world upside down. I want to be, I want to be a part of that. I want to be so uncomfortable to the people of the world, like turning things upside down, breaking things right way up, bringing heaven to earth. And so some of the... The, um, the enemies we need to be aware of because the enemies are not going to be so much external but internal. It's going to be in us, in our way of thinking, in our perspectives. So we need to, and, and get this, that God is not mending old wineskins. He is not reconstituting them. He is not pulling them apart and making, repairing, refashioning, reforming. He is saying new wineskins. Completely new thing, nothing from the old. It is a new thing. He is not reforming, he is not repairing. He's saying new wine, new wine skin. Does this make sense? Yes. So we need to have a divine dissatisfaction. We've got to have a hunger and thirst for the things of God. You've got to be able to turn off the TV. You've got to be able to get out of bed at midnight. You've got to get up at two in the morning whenever he wakes you. It's time for season of prayer and fasting. It's a time of intercession. It is a time of coming before God and saying, I surrender to you. I will be that living sacrifice. I'll pick up my cross. I'll follow you. I'll do what you've called me to do. I will not satisfy the desires of the flesh. I will not walk across according to the soul, that I am going to immerse myself in the Word of the Holy Ghost. I'm going to grow into the image of Jesus. I'm going to be equipped and edified, and I am going to fulfill everything that you called me to do, not because of who I am, not because I've made that decision, but because I've surrendered to you as a living sacrifice, because you're going to do it through me, and we're going to change the world because of who I serve. You've got to get a bit radical. Radical. So in Luke chapter 5, let me read this. It's a bit lengthy. Luke chapter 5. If it's in three Gospels, 
Do you think maybe God is trying to tell us something? New wine, new wine skins. Luke chapter 5, starting in verse 27. After these things, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at the tax office. And he said to him, Follow me. So he left everything, rose up and followed Jesus. How many of us, because I have it all the time, the minute you've heard Jesus say, do this, God, I've done it. God, is that really you? God, if that's really you, would you confirm that that's you, please? I just want to make sure it's you, God, before I step out. We rationalise, we intellectualise, we analyse, we stop and think, we want to make sure we're covered, is it safe, what has God, is it really, you know, how about just being radical and saying, you know what, Jesus, I believe this is you, so I'm going to follow you. And if it's not you, Jesus, because I believe it's you and I said I'm following you, you can sort out the mess. It's okay to get a bit messy in life. Jesus loves to clean stuff up. So Matthew, Matthew left everything, rose up and followed Jesus. Then Levi gave him a great feast in his own house, and there were a number, a great number of tax collectors and others who sat down with them. And the scribes and the Pharisees complained against his disciples, saying, Why do we drink with tax collectors and sinners? So Jesus answered and said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So right there you see new wine, old wine skin. Jesus is mixing with a group of people that the priests don't think he should mix with. So that's the old wineskin. That's the old wineskin. What are you doing talking to these people? They're all sinners. They're all dirty tax collectors. You shouldn't have anything to do with them. Think of your reputation. Think of who you are. But Jesus followed him. Remember, he only did the things the Father told him to do. John 5, 19 and 20. And the Father delighted to show him. So right there we have an example of an old wineskin trying to tell where the new wine skin should be poured, not into that dirty group of people. But in the next verse, they said to him, verse 33, Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers, and likewise those of the Pharisees, but yours eat and drink? Now we've got something coming around what they're doing as believers. And Jesus said to them, Can you make the friends of the bridegroom fast while the bridegroom is with them? But the days will come. When the bridegroom will be taken away from them, then they will fast in those days. Then Jesus spoke a parable to them. No one, again that word no one, puts a piece from a new garment on an old one. Otherwise the new makes it ten. And the piece that was taken out of the new does not match the old. No one puts new wine into old wineskins. Or else the new wine will burst the wineskins and be spilled. And the wineskins will be ruined. But new wine must, underline must, new wine must be put into new wineskins, and both are preserved. And no one, having drunk old wine, immediately desires new, for he says the old is better. That's the spirit of familiarity. That's the spirit of familiarity, the spirit of comfort, the spirit that says, it's okay, you can stay the way you are. It's okay, you don't have to increase your prayer life, you're doing okay. Your prayer life with God is okay, your time in the Word is okay. Spirit of familiarity and spirit of comfort will kill off the move of God in your life. You have got to allow the hunger that the Holy Spirit wants to put in you for word of the prayer to come to fruition and to maturity. And so it was a must. New wine must be put into new wine skin. But what we see here from verse 27 on is the Pharisees and the scribes, the ministers of the day, saying that's not the right way to behave, that's not what you should be doing, this isn't ministry, what do you think you are? They tried to contain the new move of God. They didn't recognise the day of the visitation. They didn't recognise that the very Son of God was in their midst. They were so caught up on, on behaving according to what they knew that they did not recognise the new that God had been telling them about through the prophets for hundreds of years. And we can be so caught up in our familiar, so caught up in the way church is, so caught up in our meetings that we don't recognise a new move of the Holy Ghost, that we don't recognise a new move of Jesus when he comes to pass that we don't recognise what God is doing and Jesus walks past because we didn't know enough to stop and to say, I want to be in on this. I'm recognising a call of God. I'm recognising the hunger to 
pray. I'm recognize our hunger for the, the things of God. I'm not going to let this visitation walk past. I'm going to have an encounter with God that is going to change everything. We have missed encounters with God. We've missed experiences with God because we've been so caught up in church culture, in church tradition, in the way we think, in the way we see things, in our, our, our prayer life and our work life that hasn't changed for centuries, that nothing new happens. And we wonder why this is all there is. What's the point? If we can have hundreds of churches on the Gold Coast and not transform one little neighborhood, what is the point? Something is tragically wrong. And so we can't sit around and say, well, we're going to wait for that church to do something or that thing to do something. You've got to be the ones that make the difference. You've got to be the ones that make the change. You've got to see, be the change you want to see. You've got to be the one that allows the new wine to be poured into a new wineskin. You're the one that's got to make that decision. We can do it corporately, but we're only going to be as strong as the weakest link. But you can make that decision in your prayer closet. Now, God, I want to be that new one skin. So you immerse me in the word. You stretch me out. You put me into shape. You do whatever needs to be done. But I want to be the new one skin because I want to hold the new wine. I don't want to miss the day of my visitation. I don't want to miss Jesus when he walks past. I don't want to miss an outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I don't want to miss what you're doing in this nation. I want to be a part of it. I want to be on the front line. I want to be involved. And so, Jesus, I come to you. Make me a living sacrifice. Do with me whatever you want. Immerse me in the Word. Stretch me. Pummel me. Do whatever. But let me be that new wine skin that can hold the new wine. Do whatever it takes. You were born for this. None of you were satisfied in a church. We went because that was the thing to do. And we tried to fit in, but that didn't always work. And we tried to be good little Christians, but that didn't work that much either. And we said, what's wrong with me? Why don't I fit? What's wrong with me? Nothing's wrong with you. God is wanting to pour new wine into a new wineskin. And you've had the yearning of the Holy Ghost on the inside of you to become that new wineskin so you can hold the fullness of the new wine so that you can be poured out wherever He wants to pour you out so that your life can be poured out like an offering like Paul's was so that you can be poured out on the dry and the thirsty so that you can release miracles and signs and wonders that you can walk in the power of the Holy Ghost that you can change things. None of us were satisfied sitting in church pews. I wasn't. I tried so hard to fit in and to be good. Oh, it wasn't easy going to church sometimes. And sometimes you're in church and everybody's like, hey, clappy, clappy, blessy, blessy, plastic, charismatics. And on the inside I'm crying because I know there's more, but I can't seem to access it. I was on staff at one church with Elizabeth, the one who does our business press. We were on staff. Oh my gosh. And the pastor was into all sorts of things that we had to do to build relationship. You know, we had to play cricket. Can you imagine Elizabeth and I playing cricket? <laughs> that did more to destroy relationships than build them. <sighs> we were a lot younger back then too, but honestly, seriously, cricket. Cricket. Builds relationships only for people who like cricket. <laughs> oh my gosh. And so well, there's all these things that we had to do and we had to perform and we had to, you know, hit all the hoops and things to be on staff. And we're dying on the inside. And then the pastor comes around and says, This is what I, I believe we're going to do. What do you think about it? Go away and pray and, and then come back and tell me. Well, Elizabeth and I went away and prayed and came back. We did not talk to each other. We just went away and prayed. Came back and I said, it's a good idea, but it's not God's. Oh. Oh, but there goes my employment. <laughs> but anyway, and Elizabeth said the same thing. And then he accused us of talking to each other. No, we didn't. But we would, we would go into each other's office 
in that church building and we would shut the door and we would cry because all we wanted was a move of God. And I got so tired of jumping hoops, reaching goals, ticking boxes, so tired of it. And so we just go into each other's office and cry. So God, we just want you. All I want is you. And God was trying to pour out a new wine, but we were in an old wine skin structure. Make sense? So it just didn't fit. It is okay to be different. It is okay to be radical. It is okay to walk out your destiny and fulfill your vision before the churches. Because guess what? The church's vision is everybody's vision. That's why this is Open Heaven Ministries for all. Because it's my job as part of the fivefold to equip you to do what he's called you to do. So I, got, I, I was over the church. But you know, like you want your kids to go. So, oh, it's church. I'm not going to go to church. And the kids were strong with it as I was because we'd been in churches where we had seen a move of God. Yeah. And we know what it's like when the fire goes and the miracles happen. And my grandson was raised from the dead. Where my kids had broken bones healed instantly. Where the food in our cupboard, which was only porridge and milk, did not run out for two weeks. And we're feeding six people three times a day on porridge. Let me tell you, not my favourite food today, but great story. But it, it, they saw that. They saw the power of God. When, you, when you've had a touch of that, you can't settle in church. So all of you here, you've, had, you've seen God. You've, you've known something. You've seen something supernatural. Deuteronomy tells us that we've got to have supernatural stories to tell our children. So when we get together, there are times we talk about, remember when the porridge never ran out? Remember when the car ran on empty because there was absolutely no petrol and we had to worship? And when we stopped worshipping, the car stopped? Remember those times? So we've got these stories, but they're all around the beauty and the wonder of God. New wine, new wine skin. So it's time to change. You want the new wine? Get rid of the old. Every attitude, thought, word, everything that is of the old must be removed so that we can walk into the fullness of what he's got. So the tragedy of the past removal of revivals was that there was a great move of God. The new wine was being poured out, but we reverted back to a default setting of an old wine skin. So when the pressure comes, that's what we've got to be careful of, that we don't default back to an old setting just out of pressure. So we've got to come together the fivefold. You know, it's for the equipping of the body of Christ. It's for the edifying of the body of Christ. Till we come to the unity of faith and the knowledge of the Son of God. Until we come into the measure of the maturity of the, of the fullness of Christ. So that we're no longer children tossed to and fro by this words and those words. But we actually stand mature and firm and full in all of the things of God. This is what the fivefold is about. This is what the new wine is all about. This is what he wants to call us into. So we need to be prepared for this. You know what's going to happen if you want the new wine and you want to be a new wine skin? The mold that you have allowed to be fashioned in your life about your Christianity has to be broken. Break the mold. Break the mold. You are made to be like Christ. You are not made to be like ch good churchgoers. Break the mold. Be free. Be free. And Lloyd, Apostle Lloyd, you have generational blessings that you need to make a pull on. As you make a pull on those generational blessings from past generations, as you pull on them, you're going to find that there's going to come revelation, but there's also going to come resources, and there will be a repositioning for you to move into the new. 
because of the, the blessings of the past generations, they were they were pioneers, forerunners, pace setters. So as you pull on that, that's what you're going to receive. So we've got to break the mold. There can be no mixture of old and new, which means that we're going to have to be open to the Holy Spirit saying, that's old, get rid of it. So the old and new, they cannot harmonize, there's no agreement, there's no, um, there's no, they, they cannot, no one puts new wine into it, an old wine skin. It's because it leads to destruction, it leads to wastage, and who, who knows, you know, we've all been in churches where things have happened and we thought it was good, we thought it was God, but it was good, and so the souls stop getting saved or things stop happening and, and, and it just became tired and hard. Compromise came in. Because the challenge with a big church or a church that's been going for a long time is you've got to be able to keep feeding the beast. You've got to keep the money coming in to feed the staff. You've got to keep... It's a beast. We do not want an organisation. We want a living organism, the body of Christ. That's the challenge. So we've got to submerge ourselves. So some of the things that are going to have to go is religious mindsets, religious perspectives, um, tradition, attitudes. Numbers chapter... Just turn to this one. Numbers chapter 13. And we'll finish very shortly. Because we've got a great afternoon tea over there. Thank you so much, Jason and Kate. Numbers 13. Verse 30. Caleb quieted the people before Moses. Most of you know the story. They've been out, they've seen the promised land, they've come back. And Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession. We are well able to overcome. We are well able to overcome. And now if you move across to um, 1426. 1426, verse 26. No, that's not it. Where's the one that says they've got a different spirit? 44. 24. Yeah. My servant Caleb, because he has a different spirit in him and has followed me fully, I will bring it to the land where he went and his descendants shall inherit it. So everybody else missed out on their inheritance. Everybody else died off in the wilderness. But because he had a different spirit, and talk about a different spirit, you know, he put up with six million grumbling, moaning, complaining Israelites in the wilderness for 40 years and never sinned, never never did anything. He just followed God with a pure heart, clean hands. Pure heart, clean hands. Pure heart, clean hands. And he was the one that got the inheritance because he had a different spirit. That is a prayer that you should be praying over yourself every day. God, I want to be like Joshua and Caleb. Father, I want the different spirit. I want to be one who follows you fully. I want to be one who's wholly surrendered. I want to be one who just goes with you wherever you tell me to go. I want to have that heart of conquering, that heart of victory, that I can go up at once and take it because we're well able to do it, because you've empowered us. You've, you've empowered us that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us, that all things are possible with God. We can do this. We can take this. No, no defeat, no delay, no back down. We can do this. We are well able. God's hand is on our lives and the hand of God is not on the enemy. It's not on the world. It's not on the people who oppose us. We are blessed to be a blessing and he said, I'll bless those who bless you and I'll curse those who curse you and that Abrahamic blessing is still working in our lives today. And so we've got to have that same kind of spirit that says, you know what, I really don't care what the body of Christ, generally speaking, is doing. I'm just going to do what God tells me to do. I'm just going to follow Jesus wholeheartedly. I'm going to yield to the leading of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to obey every nudge that he gives me and I'm going to walk forward with him. I'm going to take the land. Take the land. And so attitudes and language has to change. Language has to change. We often use the word waiting on the Lord as an excuse for not getting into his presence and hearing his instructions. We have a lot of Christian cliches that we can fling around, but they're mainly things that we fling out to deflect. 
We need to change our language. We need to start talking kingdom, not church. We need to talk new covenant, not old covenant. We need to talk not only about the grace of God, but about the empowerment that grace brings, because grace is not just grace. It's an empowerment to do what he's called us to do. We need to talk about inheritance, destiny and purpose. We need to talk about warfare. We need to talk about justice in the courts of heaven. We need to talk about taking nations. We need to talk about discipling nations, not just evangelizing one-on-one, -on -one, but actually discipling a nation. We need to change our vocabulary to reflect the power, the majesty and the glory of Jesus Christ. And we need to change the way we speak because you're no longer a human being. You have been born again. You're a brand new creation in Christ. There was nothing like you before you were born again. You have now been elevated. You're seated in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. It is not like us to speak like the people of the world. We speak now with faith. We speak with life. We speak with hope. We speak with authority. We speak with authenticity. We speak with integrity. We speak with breakthrough, miracles, signs and wonders. We have a different language now. And you can't realize we cannot talk like the people of the world. We cannot talk like churchgoers because you are kingdom believers. And that's a whole different thing. And between the Old and the New Testament, there was a minimum of 85 differences. Minimum. And half the time, we don't even know what covenant we're living in. We need to change. Radical change. Romans chapter 12 verse 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. So to, in order to be that new wine skin, to hold the new wine, you are going to have to renew your mind. So that word conform means don't conform to self in mind or character. Don't conform to something that is already established. Allow God to, to transform you into the image of Christ. That, that transformation, it means that something happens that it makes you unrecognizable. When the moth or the caterpillar becomes a butterfly, it is totally unrecognizable. Yeah. When you look at that butterfly, you can't recognize that it came from a caterpillar. Yeah. Totally different. You've got to allow God to transform you by the renewing of your mind into something that is totally unrecognizable to who you were in the past or who you were in church. And it both means renewed, re-repeat, new, do something from the beginning. Renew your mind. Take your mind back to what it was before the fall. Take it back to what it was with Adam and Eve before the fall. Take it back, renew it back before the fall. Renew it back to what Adam and Eve had. Renew it back so that you flow with the mind of Christ and the wisdom of God is formed on the inside of you. Renew it back. You know, we sort of think renewing the mind is just, you know, changing the way we think. No, we're going right back to what it was before the fall. Right back into the fullness of the anointing of Christ, of God that was on the mind of Adam, where he could name all the, you know, the wisdom of God. Solomon, we see parts of it. We've got to change, guys. It's, it, we, we think renewing the mind is just about memorizing some scriptures so that things change, but it doesn't bring transformation. And as I said to you some months ago, I said to the Lord, my life is not transforming. And he said, your mind is not renewing. Big change, immediately, right there, okay. It's been renewed. And there has been transformation in certain areas of my life that I have prayed about for years. And transformation has come. Wine skin. You know, when the Americans uh, moved into Japan during the Second World War, they were concerned about Japan. And they wanted the effects of war and the ravages of war to be turned around, that it would become, you know, a functioning nation again. And so a man went in there, I can't remember his name, but he went in there with a theory called CANI, C-A-N-I, Constant and Never Ending Improvement. And that's something that means that, he, you know, we adopt, we improve and we expand. Constant and never ending improvement. But that constantly, I am reaching for more of God. Never ending because his government is never ending. I want to see the government of God in my life continue to expand and to release. I want, to, I want more of God. I want more of his power, more experiences. I want more intimacy. 
I want to see more. I want to see more transformation. I want to see things change. I want to get answers to prayer. I want to see lives turned around, families brought together. We want to see Gold Coast become a, a you know, what God has called this place to be. We want to see Australia become a part of the nations that are the sound land of the Holy Spirit. We've got this hunger of God and we're sitting back thinking, oh, well, it's all right. God will take care of it. God is calling for an army to come to him so that he can pour out his desires into us so that we can reach for it and we can say, God, we want that constant and never-ending improvement of the kingdom of God in our nation, that constant and never-ending extension of your kingdom. God, we come before you and we will renew our minds. We will not conform to what is here, but we will be transformed. We will be totally transformed, totally unrecognizable from who we are into what you've called us to be. We've got to step out of church. Now, I haven't given you any opportunity today to speak. Next week. But I've given you plenty to think about. Church has got a God. Church mindset. Church wineskin. Even the way the apostle and the prophet move together has got to change. Because the way the prophet, the prophet and the apostle work together was in the church. That was the way it worked in the church. It's not the way it works now. It's different. It's kingdom. Kingdom is a different dynamic between the apostle and the prophet. It's a different dynamic. We've got to learn what that is and flow with that. And it's not so much about bringing a word, but it's about what's happening in the realm of the spirits so that the apostle can land in. for the new wine. We want that, hey? I am so fed up with Christianity. So over going to church. When it's church, I go to some very religious churches. <laughs> so today, we're drawing a line in the sand, although it's more aligned with the blood. dissatisfied, totally dissatisfied with Christianity as it has been presented to us. We want the reality of the kingdom. 